a whole bunch of months ago, Nathan and Karis asked if I would teach on the wheel and the line, and of course I said yes. And so that's what I'll be doing. This week I'll teach on the wheel, and next week I'll be teaching on the line. So what is the wheel and the line anyway? Well, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Well, how does one exactly live in a victorious, abundant life? Especially in this generation when we're just, ex there's just an acceleration of, of change and stress. There's tremendous stress on us to succeed. Lots of pressure on people today, and especially our young people. And the moral compass of society is pretty much non-existent. I mean, the lines, there are no lines. And then it's getting harder and harder and harder to have healthy relationships and successful marriages. We can see that the divorce rate is increasing all the time. And so one sense of peace, stability, and security cannot be anchored in some external relationship or external environmental issues but one's peace has to be anchored deep, deep in one's own heart from within. I don't know why this thing is in and out, but we're just going to keep going. Okay, so the wheel and the line beautifully, beautifully illustrates the truths that are in the Bible. And the Bible is really the owner's manual from the creator of how, the how-tos and how we can live the abundant life and how we can live the victorious life. As I was saying, The Wheel in the Line is taken from the Handbook to Happiness, and it's written by Charles R. Solomon. And he started Grace Fellowship International in 1969 in Colorado, and it's still going strong, but they've moved their headquarters to Tennessee. And so this teaching that I'm going to share with you, it's more than just a teaching for me. This teaching is really my life experience, and it's really a life's message. And I have to tell you that if you actually put these biblical principles and truths into practice, I know that I know that I know that I know it really, really works. And God used this and the scripture passages that I'm going to be sharing with you. It literally transformed my life and set me free from an addictive behavioral patterns and lots of other stuff, lots of sin issues and behavioral patterns. So this is really cool. So what we're going to do, let's hope that this works. It works. Yay! All right, in our first wheel, this is a picture of you. This is what you look like. And I'm going to get my little wheel out here. And you are spirit, soul, and body. And the Bible talks about man being a triunity in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse, or verse 23, where it says, May the God of peace himself, this is something that God does, sanctify you completely. Now, sanctify is a very, very big word. And it means to make holy, to set apart, as sacred and to purify and make us free from sin. So, and may your spirit, your whole spirit, and your soul and your body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has called you, and he is faithful, and he himself will do it. And that's where we get the whole idea that man is spirit, soul, and body. Now let's take a look at the spiritual part. The spiritual part, the spirit part of man, that's the spiritual part. It's the God consciousness. It's that part of ourselves that relates to God. And in the spirit, in man's spirit, we have the intuition, the conscience, and the communion. So let's take a look at the intuition. Now I call the intuition the mind of the spirit. Your spirit has a mind as well as your soul. And it's that place in you that has this direct connection with God. And all of you have it. You're all created with the Spirit. 
and you all have the ability to hear the voice of God. It's not just for a few people, but it's for everyone. And it's that place where we hear the voice of God, my sheep hear my voice. It's where we get prophetic revelation. It's where we get words of knowledge. It's where we get visions. And it's where we get impressions and things like that. And that that is totally independent from the reasoning process or from your cognitive ability to figure things out. The mind figures things out. But the intuition of the spirit just knows that it knows that it knows. An example of this would be you wake up one morning and you feel impressed to call a friend. You have no idea that friend is just on your mind. Call, call Jane, you know, call Judy, call, call Frank. And so you end up picking up the phone and you call this person and they're in tears and they say, thank God you called. I am so low, I am so in trouble, I needed some encouragement today. And then they begin to share their heart from you. Total God thing. You had no idea that they were in that space, but the Holy Spirit prompted you in the intuitive part of your spirit to call so-and-so because they needed your help. And then the next part is conscience. That conscience part of our spirit is the place that knows the difference between good and evil. And this is the very interesting part of the conscience. It's possible to put your conscience asleep. And it's even, this is scary, it's even possible to sever your conscience by constant disobedience to the word of God and ignoring the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, Apostle Paul warns young Timothy as his mentor and spiritual father and he says in 1 Timothy, hold fast to the faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. You can make shipwreck of your faith. And I want to give you some examples of how you can put your conscience asleep or even sever your conscience. Say you go into 7-Eleven and you steal a candy bar. And then you walk out and you go, ooh, dush, I shouldn't have done that. Stealing is wrong, thou shalt not steal. Mm. So you go in 7-Eleven the next week and you steal a candy bar again. And you walk out of 7-Eleven and you go, hmm, mm, probably shouldn't be doing this. You go in a third week or to Walmart, steal a candy bar, maybe a shirt or something under your shirt. And you don't feel a thing and you don't hear a thing. Eh, whatever. Nobody will know. And that's how we put our conscience asleep. You know it's wrong, and the Spirit tells you it's wrong. And we do that with issues of pornography. We'll be looking at pornography the first time. We go, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And then the second time, mm, and then the third time, oh, no one's going to know. It's not hurting anybody. Whatever I do in the privacy of my own room, it's not going to hurt anybody. And so we end up putting our conscience to sleep, and we end up even severing our conscience. And now let's look at the third thing. The third thing in the spirit is communion. And the Bible says those who worship him, well, it says this in John chapter 4, verse 24. I want to give you the scripture passages. That God is spirit and that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So now let's look at the soul part of this circle. The soul part is your psychological self-conscious part. And that's the part that relates to other people. So a lot of times when people have emotional problems or psychological problems, their tendency is to go to a psychologist. Now, in the soul, there's the mind. That's your thinker. There's the emotions. That's your feeler or where your affections lie. And then there's the will. That's your freedom and your ability to make choices and to choose. And then the next part we have is the physio physical body, the body part, which is the physiological or the world conscious part that relates to our environment. We call that the physiological part. And then when we have problems with our body, we go to a physician for help. All right, now something I want you to take note of is that there are arrows from the spirit to the soul, and then there's an arrow from the soul to the body, and it goes back and forth. 
It's very interesting that when you suffer from physical ailments such as an endocrine disorder or you suffer from a disease that causes you a lot of pain, it can affect your emotional state and it can affect the choices that you make. The same thing with your personal spirit. If your personal spirit is maladjusted, if it's confused, if you're making a lot of wrong choices and wrong decisions in your life, it can affect how you think, it can affect how you feel, and it can affect the choices that you make, which in turn will actually affect your physical body. Now this is very interesting. When a person doesn't know the Lord or chooses not to know the Lord or to be a follower of Jesus, the Bible talks about us being spiritually dead, spiritually dead inside. And it says this in Ephesians chapter 1, or chapter 2 rather, verses 1 to 3. And I want to read it to you. Ephesians. It's in my Bible here. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So when a person doesn't know Jesus or chooses not to have Jesus Christ as the center of their life, they're spiritually dead, and one of three things can happen. They can actually Follow the course of the world. That's number one, just like it says in Ephesians chapter 2, which the course of the world is materialism, vain philosophies and principles, worldly desires and passions, false religions, submitting yourself to the shifting moral codes that are out there. And this is, I think, very important if our focus is really focused on the world, we get caught up in fear, anxiety, and a lot of stress. Because focusing on the world around us, there is absolutely no peace. There's no stability. And so that's what it means when we're spiritually dead. We might focus our life on the world. The second thing it states, states that we might follow the prince of the air, the power of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. In other words, we might yield ourselves to demonic activity and what Paul talks about, the doctrine of demons. So that's the second choice when we're spiritually dead. Or the third thing it mentions in Ephesians chapter 2, it's living in the passions of our flesh and carrying out all the desires of our mind. And, and, and of our passions and what I want, I get. And my, when, I, when I want it, I get what I want. And most of the time, this opens the door to demonic activity in our life when we, when we just follow the passions of our flesh. And I find this very interesting that in our baptismal rite, when we are water baptized, there are three things that we renounce in prayer before we go into the baptismal waters. We renounce the world, the devil, and our own flesh, according to Ephesians chapter 2. And I don't know if you were aware of that. Because your personal spirit will attach itself to something, either worldly values, demonic stuff, or your own flesh and your own carnal desires, but it will attach itself to something or someone. All right, so let's go to our next line, or wheel rather. Now, in this particular wheel, we see something very interesting. In our next wheel, this is a person 
who has been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ through faith. And that's why the big C is in the part of the spirit. They have attached themselves to Christ. Now there are other words for this conversion experience that are kind of floating out there in the Christian community. It could mean I've been born again, or I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my savior, or I'm receiving Jesus into my heart, or I'm entering into a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. These are all the different terms and phrases that one uses concerning their conversion experience. And this is what happens when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ. It's a work of the Holy Spirit from start to finish. Because first of all, the Holy Spirit prepares the heart to receive the truth and the good news of Jesus Christ. How does the Holy Spirit do that? Well, he can produce a hunger. Hunger in your heart. You know, there's got to be more to life. You know, life has gone on, and there's, there's just something missing in my life. And so there's the hunger. Or the Holy Spirit might bring you into circumstances that, you know, life has just taken you to a dead end. And you say, you know, life is a dead end. There's got to be more. I just feel so empty. And another way the Holy Spirit prepares us is through the lifestyle character and the actions of love from other followers of Jesus that make us really hungry and thirsty for God. And those are the three things that happened in my life personally that got me hooked, that got me to say, Jesus, I need you, because I thought there's got to be more. There's, there's got to be more. You can get this relationship with God and then I saw the lifestyle of other believers around me, and I thought, I want what they have. And so our Christian witness is very important. You might not know it, but it's very important. Your prayers are very important because your very prayers for the lost prepare until the ground of the heart so that people will be ready to hear the good news of Jesus. And so that's the first thing that happens. And then the next thing that happens in order for salvation to happen is that the Holy Spirit convinces us that what the Bible says about God and about man, it's true. The Bible says that we're born sinners and that we need God's help. It says this in Romans chapter 5 in the Bible, verse 12. It says, therefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, and all men have sinned. You see, when you were born, you inherited a physical DNA that kind of determined your body shape, the color of your eyes, whether you like it or not. It determines kind of your intellectual abilities, and even some of your gifts and your talents, even spiritual gifts. There's a tendency where spiritual gifts run in families. And it also, you inherited in that physical DNA some predispositions to physical diseases and, and chronic illnesses and sicknesses and stuff like that. Well, at your birth, at your conception, you also inherited a spiritual DNA from your great, 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 on and on and on, from your great, great grandfather, Adam. And you inherited a spiritual DNA. And in that spiritual DNA, it says, we, in, we inherited our sin nature, our rebelliousness to live apart from God. I'm going to be my own man. I'm going to be my own woman. I'm going to do my own thing. That was kind of Adam's attitude. Hmm, maybe I can be a little bit like God. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is our spiritual DNA. And there's nothing you can do about it. When you were conceived, you inherited that as well as your physical DNA. And Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Oh boy, I got a problem here. How am I going to get out of this mess? And the only person that can get us out of this mess is Jesus Christ. 
The only way out is to receive the free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Because it's in and through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross that my sin nature, that DNA, has been dealt with completely. And it's through his death on the cross and his shed blood that all the sins I commit have been forgiven. I mean, that is incredible. And that's what we get in our salvation. And it's so easy. It's ridiculous. Some people have a hard time that it can be that simple to be saved. It says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is forgiven, declared innocent, and it's with the mouth that one confesses. And the Bible talks about that. Whatever is in your heart is going to come out your mouth. Whatever you believe in, whatever your center is, it's going to come out your mouth. And so if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord, it's going to come out your mouth and you will confess it. That's pretty darn cool. I love this story about the jailer where he asked the Apostle Paul, he's in, in the book of Acts, he says, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not only you, but your whole household. And I go, wow, there's actually a chance to change the spiritual DNA of our families and of future generations, because all it takes is one person in our family to come to know the truth and to ask Jesus Christ into their heart and to persevere in prayer for the rest of the family members, and it can change the spiritual DNA of our families and generations to come. Some of us, that's the call of God upon our life, to change the course of the generations that are to come after you through faith in Jesus and through persevering prayer. Isn't that something? That is a huge destiny that is resting upon your life. And never give up. Never give up. Reese Howes prayed for a man for 40 years, and it wasn't until a month after he was in the ground that that man came to faith in Jesus Christ. He changed that man's spiritual DNA forever. Now let's go to the next one. Assurance number two. Assurance well, this is very interesting. The assurance of our salvation must be based on the facts of God's word. Salvation is not a feeling. You don't wake up one day and say, I feel saved, honey. Do you feel saved? Or sometimes we'll ask our friends after we've prayed the prayer with them and says, how do you feel? Well, they might feel nothing, and therefore they think nothing happened. Uh, the assurance of our salvation is the facts of the word of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So this is the order. Facts, faith, lay hold of the facts by faith, and feelings come and go. Some days you'll feel the presence of God incredibly intensely. Oh man, did you feel that in worship? I mean, did you feel it? Well, tomorrow you might wake up and feel like, hmm. You might have a really great day. You might have a bad day. You might screw it up royally and wondering, boy, am I still saved? Well, the assurance of your salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ, whether you're in a gray day, whether you're in a dark day, or whether you're basking in the glory of God. Facts, faith, and sometimes feelings. So let's go to the security thing. And this is kind of why I wanted the headset. So I'm going to put my mic down and I'm going to try to speak nice and loud because I want to give you and show you an example of what it means to feel secure. Very gently here. <clears throat> mm. 
My security is in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, My life is hidden in Christ with God. Now let's pretend that this hand is the Heavenly Father, and let's pretend that this hand is the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it possible for your Heavenly Father to reject Jesus? No. What do you think, huh? No. no, it's impossible. All right, now Colossians 3.3 says, this is your heart that you've given to Jesus. Isn't that a cool thing? Yeah. My life is hidden in Christ with God. Is it possible for the Father to reject you? No. no. How come? Yes, because you're in Christ. So when the Father looks at you, no matter what kind of day you're having, a good day or bad day, where you feel particularly spiritual or unspiritual, when the Father looks at you, he sees Jesus. And Jesus is your holiness, your righteousness, your justification, your sanctification. He is everything that you need. And your life is hidden in Christ with God. I repeat that scripture to myself all the time because it brings me tremendous comfort and tremendous peace that I'm hidden away in Jesus. Isn't that good news? And that is the security of your salvation. It's not based on your performance or what you do that's right, but it's based on the fact of the Word of God that your life is hidden in Christ with God. Now let's look at acceptance once again, the facts. Ephesians chapter 1, I am accepted in the beloved. When I was a very brand new believer, I read Ephesians over and over and over again. Ephesians chapter 1 just redid my dome because I discovered everything that I receive as a fact of Christ in me. Ephesians chapter 1, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. In Christ, you have grace. In Christ, you have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, you have forgiveness. In Christ, you have a destiny. And in Christ, you have received the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's not about what you do, but it's about what Jesus has done for you and to accept it by faith. And that's what our acceptance is resting upon. Now, number five, total commitment. Total commitment, what does that mean? It is the only thing out of one through four that is required of us. And it is our response to this free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's the only thing that the Lord looks to us to, to, uh, to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's all I can do for this free gift of salvation is to worship. And how do I worship? By surrendering and giving my life to him. So that we not only know him as savior, but we know him as Lord. And what does that look like to know him as Lord? This is very interesting. I like to compare our self as a car. And most of us, when we're driving a car, we're sitting in the front seat behind the wheel and we're driving our own car. We go where we want to go, we do what we want to do, and we take our vehicle to wherever that we want to go. And that's what the big S in the center. It's not Christ. Christ is in the life, but Christ isn't the center of the life. Someone else is driving this dude's car. And it's self. Self is in control. But what it means to offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice is turn over the keys to your car, to Jesus. Turn over the keys to self. You get in the back seat, and now Jesus Christ is the driver of your car. 
and he will take you to the right place at the right time and will fulfill the call and the destiny and purposes of God in your life. And that's what it means to offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice unto God. Unfortunately, lots of Christians just stop right here. Got Christ in my life, I'm saved, all that kind of stuff. Most Christians don't go on to maturity because they never put Christ as the center of the life. No, it's, and so, so they're Christians and they don't understand why am I not experiencing victory in my life? Why, why am I not experiencing this life most abundantly? And it's because self is in control and they're driving their vehicle and not Jesus Christ. And if self is in charge of the life, then we see a lot of Christians who just experience a lot of difficulties in their life. And that takes us to our next wheel. Here we go. Self is in the center of the life. Self is in control of the life, even though they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And in this particular wheel, when self is in control of one's life, other things will always take charge of the person's life that become their center place, their center space, where they are preoccupied, where they pour in all their energies. When self is in control, it gets preoccupied with all sorts of stuff. And a real favorite book of mine is this book, by Stephen Covey, which is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Powerful Lessons in Personal Change. And he talks about all the things that tend to preoccupy people when they're in control of their life. And he actually lists 10 things. And I find it very interesting that these are the 10 things that our self-life will focus on apart from Jesus. Our life, or our self-life, can be focused on our spouses. Yes, everything. Your spouse is your, your rock, your fortress, your love, and all that kind of stuff. But sooner or later, since they're human and broken, disappointments and conflict sets in. Another thing that the self-life centers itself on are family relationships. Well, those relationships change. Children grow up, they leave home, and sometimes those relationships can be very challenging and very difficult, and instead of ministering life to you, they can take life from you. Some people, their self-life revolves around money, very money-centered, and you are very vulnerable to anything that threatens your economy, economic security. Like, suppose you lose your job. Suppose suddenly you're struggled with disabilities. The economic changes from day to day. If that's what the center of your life is rooted and grounded in, you're in big trouble. You could be work-centered. You are only comfortable when you are working. And you're, this is interesting. A lot of people, their identity rests in what they do. Sometimes when we meet people, we say, what do you do for a living? As though that defines who you are. Well, I'm a brain surgeon. You know, mm, mm. I'm a ditch digger. Mm, mm. You know, so maybe we look down upon ourselves. And what we do becomes our identity. Well, suppose that's taken away from you for one reason or another, then what will your identity and your life purpose rest upon? Some people are, in their self-life, possession-centered. The most important thing is all the stuff you have and that other people see the stuff you have. Others, it's pleasure-centered. You feel secure only when you're on a pleasure high. We can get addicted. We've seen people, Don and I, who have been utterly addicted to pleasure. It can be friend-centered, where you're highly dependent on the opinion of other people. It can be enemy-centered, so you have an obsession 
with, you know, what is my enemy doing and how can I get back at them and when are things going to change, blah, 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 that kind of thing. You can be church-centered, believe it or not, church-centered insofar as your identity is wrapped up in your gifts and abilities and what people think of you, of that highly prophetic voice. Or, man, look at how she serves the poor. Wish I was like her. And so your whole identity is the things that you do that make you look good in terms of your church life or kind of pump your own ego to make you feel good about yourself. And it's very performance orientated. Or you can be self-centered, very narcissistic. Your judgment criteria are, if it feels good, what I want, what I need, what's in it for me, and your whole view is about self. Every conversation floats back to you. So you monopolize conversations, you do everything to bring attention to self. Those are some of the things that the self-life attaches itself to. And I'm sure we can all identify, I could identify in my early years with some of those things, and I realized, boy, every one of these is sink and sand. Every one of these has something that can go absolutely wrong. And I, I really see that Jesus says it very beautifully in Matthew chapter 7. It says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. So any of these things that the self-life attaches itself to, you can bet your boots that the rain is going to come, the flood is going to come, the wind is going to blow, and it's going to crash it is going to crash. And you will be like the foolish man who built with the self-life in control. You will be the foolish man or the foolish woman who built your house upon the sand, the shifting sand of all those things the self-life attaches it to. And sooner or later, it will crash. And when it crashes, this is what happens. Let's look at the wheel. In the soul, you begin to have a lot of personal problems. You begin to have feelings of inferiority because there will always be somebody who could do it better than you. You'll have feelings of insecurity because your security is built on money, economics, friendships, relationships, spiritual gifts, what other people think of you. Sooner or later, the self-life will feel inadequate because you will come upon a situation where you won't be able to control it, you won't be able to change it, and you will feel weak and vulnerable, and you're going to need help outside yourself. And that produces a great deal of insecurity and inadequacy, feelings of inadequacy. And number four, there's guilt, real guilt and imaginary guilt. And what is that all about? Well, real guilt is when we actually sin and the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of sin in your conscience. And the only way to get out of that is to confess your sins. He's faithful and good to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And I want to make it very clear that the Holy Spirit never plays games. He'll never make you feel guilty and never know what it was. But the Holy Spirit will make it very clear, the conviction will come, and you will know what has grieved his spirit. Now, what's false guilt? False guilt is always rooted in rejection, where you go, gee, I feel bad, I walk into a room and I, what did I do wrong? It feels like people are ignoring me. I feel like I did something wrong, but I can't quite find out what the sin is. That's not, that's false guilt. Because remember, the Holy Spirit will convict you clearly of what the issues are. The only way out of false guilt is to meditate on God's love for you. Because false guilt is rooted in rejection. Maybe somebody's having rejecting thoughts towards you because you didn't perform quite right, you know. And so you feel bad, you feel guilty, you feel like, gee, I must have done something wrong. 
Well, that's their problem, their judgment, their calling you to perform. And the way to get yourself out of that, God loves me. God accepts me. And being anchored in his love. And then it, when self is in control and all these other things are in control, then we slip into worries, doubts, and fears. You know, if I have to be adequate, if I have to face the troubles of life, if I have to pay bills when I don't have a job, then we start, you know, looking to self, looking to self, looking to self. Worries, doubts, and fears begin to kick in because I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have the strength to face the death of a loved one. What am I going to do? And so we can have worries, we can have doubts, we can have fears that slip in. And if that happens long enough in our life, there's a line that goes from on top of the inferiority into self, and the word is frustration. We begin to feel frustrated inside. Frustration is at the milder end of anger. It is a form of anger, but it's kind of at the milder spectrum. And if that frustration goes on long enough and it builds up inside, then we start to get mad. Then we have anger issues in our life. We get to be ticked off at self, ticked off at the people around us, ticked off at God, and this hostility can let itself out at work. And you're that person who's grumpy at work and just mean to your co-workers, or you can take it out on your family. You come home and you just pick a fight with your kids or you pick a fight with your spouse or whatever, but you begin to take it out. But if you're too good of a Christian and too nice of a person to do that, to take all your anger and hostility out, what you'll do is you'll internalize that anger and you'll start beating yourself up. And that'll come out in the form of depression. Instead of calling you stupid, I'll say, oh, I'm stupid. You know. I always ask myself the question when I'm anger, I always ask myself, who am I angry with? What am I angry about? And usually it helps take me to the root of my depression. And so we beat ourselves up and we accuse ourselves because we're too nice to accuse the people we're angry with. Or you can take it out in the form of anxiety. Anxiety is worry, concern, fearfulness, nervousness. When the self feels inadequate to meet some of life's challenges, like the feelings of inferiority, insecurity, inadequacy, it causes self to slip into performance orientation to be loved and to be accepted. And performance orientation in our lives creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. Because when we, we get nervous, we get anxious when we go into a situation, don't know whether we're going to perform quite well. So we get really anxious. And it can get so bad that we actually have panic attacks. And so that's, that's the emotional part of it. We can take it out internally. Let's look at the mind. It has four things in there. Fantasy, schizophrenia, paranoia, and obsessive thoughts. Number one, fantasy is anything you use to escape your personal pain. And it can be anything. Hit the refrigerator, open up that bag of chips, it always makes me feel good. When I sit in front of the boob tube, eat a bag of chips, the day's troubles go away from me. Or one woman I knew, she would spend the whole weekend when she had a bad weekend, she would read Harlequin Romance and just carry off on a fantasy world. Alcohol is a good thing that people slip off into their world of fantasy. Drugs marijuana and weed. Well, I feel good. Had a crappy day, but boy, do I feel good, and I don't care about what happens. That's fantasy. That's what the self does to cope. And Jesus doesn't want you to cope. He wants to give you victory, and he wants to give you an abundant life. And so fantasy, some people work out. They go to the gym for three hours, and boy, I got rid of all my anger and my hostility. I just pump weights for three hours, and I got rid of it all. That still can be a form of fantasy. Schizophrenia is building castles in the air, a make-believe world, and then living in it as though it's real. That's a very simplistic explanation of schizophrenia, but we're not a class on psychology right now. Paranoia is 
nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm gonna go eat some worms. Or you just feel like nobody loves me. And you just get paranoid that everybody's against you. That's mild paranoia, too severe paranoia. And par severe paranoia looks like I'm gonna lock myself up in my house because somebody's really after me. And I can't go out anymore, so we shut ourselves up for months. And we don't go in because somebody's after us. And then there's number four, there's obsessive thoughts, which I think is the most common thing that the self-life struggles with, where we think and we think and we think, if only I get a degree behind my name, people will just really think I'm, I'm something. They'll think I'm really smart. And then, you know, the self-life will feel good. Or if only I could be beautiful, or if only I could be handsome, if only I could weigh maybe 130 pounds rather than 190 pounds, then I would look good and people would really love me. And so we're obsessed. We get on this obsession of performing, of doing stuff to get the education, to get the bodies we need, or to be spiritual, or to do this, or to do that. We obsess about it. That's what the self-life does in order to feel good about ourselves and in order to be loved. Now, if all of these things, let's go to our next wheel. If all of these things continue on in your life long enough, what happens is that it can spill over into the physical body and cause various diseases and illnesses of various kinds, okay? Because you're living under stress. When the self-life is in control, you live under stress, fears, anxiety, inferiority, insecurity, inadequacy. It causes a lot of stress in your physical body. And doctors will tell you, some doctors say 80% of all of our physical diseases are psychologically uh, rooted in stress and difficulty. Some say even 100%. And so beware of that. And it's very interesting that when we pray for people, we never want to assume just because they're physically sick that there's some hidden sin in their life. Because that is not the truth, that this calls for a lot of discernment. So many of the healings that Jesus did in the New Testament, they were not associated with a specific sin. And then there were other times, like the paralytic, who Jesus forgave his sins and then said, take up your bed and walk. And also something that Nathan preached on in James 5, where confess your sins one to another and pray for one another in order that ye might be healed. So that's, that's that particular wheel. Now let's go to our very last one, wheel number five. This is what happens when the self-life takes its proper place and is in submission to Jesus Christ as Lord. This is a picture of what happens when a person has turned the keys of their car over to Jesus. And Jesus Christ is at the center of the life. Number one, we have the mind of Christ. Have this mind among you, Christ within you. And so now, you can just ask the Lord, what should I do? Consult the Lord. Ask for wisdom. Commit your way to the Lord. Seek his counsel. You don't have to rely on self to come up with the answers, but now we have the word of God and the mind of Christ. Number two, the strength given by Christ. And that's uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Self has limits, but God has no limit to what he can strengthen you. And sooner or later, you will come up upon circumstances in your life where you will not be able to handle it, deal with it, cope with it, been there, done that. I know what that's like. And then we know that through Jesus Christ, I can make it through this. And then there's Philippians 4:19, the next one. All needs supplied. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And how do we make that known to the Lord? Ask. Prayers of petition. And then there's the peace that passes all understanding when Jesus Christ is at the center of the life. And that's Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Don't be anxious about anything 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, because thanksgiving is the exercising of faith, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. He can give you peace in situations that it surpasses. How surpasses all understanding? How do I have peace in this situation? It's a disaster. But God just blankets you with this supernatural peace. And then it says, he will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He camps out. He guards your heart. He guards your mind. And I've even found him to guard my emotions. And that isn't just spiritual stuff. It's just, it's just everything where the peace of God will come. And then, of course, in John 15, God longs for us to experience the fullness of joy that goes way beyond your own personal experiences. And of course, when Christ is in the center and you begin to experience the mind of Christ, the strength of Christ, and all your needs supplied, and the peace that passes understanding, and the fullness of joy, it slips over into your physical body, and you begin to experience the Holy Spirit lifting off the effects of stress lifting off sickness and disease. I knew a woman who got healed of diabetes when she was healed in her soul and forgave the woman who stole her husband from her. I know another young lady who was healed of severe back pain when she got right with God, forgave her mother for being an invalid, and her back was healed because she went and made Christ her center. I could go on and on with people I have prayed for that when they made Christ the center and they moved in forgiveness, they moved in repentance, all of these things became real to them and they were starting to walk in a victorious, abundant life. So Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have given us everything that we need. These are the truths and the principles of your word. And Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would give us a revelation of where our self-life is at, whether it's in the soul, where it's supposed to be, or whether it's at the center. And Lord, speak to us, what is, what is it that we really, really love? Is it you, Jesus, or is it other things, other people, or self? Because, Lord, you long, you long to give us a victorious and abundant life. You long to set us free. So, Holy Spirit, just come. Lord, I thank you that through this word, you are preparing us for the uncertainty of the future. This is very strategic timing of this word, of the wheel and the line. We felt that urgency in pre-service prayer, that our future is uncertain. Your personal future is uncertain. And he does not want you to go down, but to go up. So Lord, this is your mercy your word is your grace. Because, Lord, we know that lives rooted in God are never, ever uprooted. And, Lord, you don't want us ever to be defeated or ever to be uprooted. So, God, help us to see it, help us to get it, help us to lay hold of it. Because this is your mercy in preparation for the future. In Jesus' name. Amen.